Okay, is this any better? Yep, that's better. Great. Um, so, my name's Steffi. I'm one of the um, ACHD clinical fellows. Um, and I'm just going to follow on from James's talk with um, a case review of a patient with Epstein's. Um, so, the aim of this talk is just to really review the clinical case um, and just sort of, uh, Dr. Oliver sort of covered the general management aspects in an over overview. Um, we'll go through um, sort of investigations that we did on this particular patient and uh, sort of talk through the findings. Um, interestingly, this this case popped up on a week when I think we saw, I saw maybe three or four Epstein, so it was a typical um, you know, they all come in sort of threes sort of case. Um, so uh, the patient in question is a 54 year old female. Um, she was seen in one of our satellite clinics, um, having presented for, really for the first time in a long time, presumed to have been lost to follow up. Um, background as far as we knew was um, a history of cardiac surgery in 1974. And at that point it was, um, surgery for a presumed VSD, um, ASD, um, sorry, presumed ASD and a VSD closure with an open pulmonary valvotomy. Um, she'd had a history of sort of atypical atrial flutter and had two normal pregnancies previously, which were uneventful, um, and history of IBS. Um, so we sort of dug out the operation note from 1974, which is like a historical relic, um, and you can see there that diagnosis quoted at that point was ASD, VSD and pulmonary stenosis, which we do wonder, perhaps because the technology wasn't quite so sophisticated then, whether, you know, she was misdiagnosed in childhood. Um, so she underwent the operation and the, and the sort of up note mentions that the right ventricle was hypertrophied and also enlarged. Um, in terms of when she presented, so medication that she was taking at the time, she was on bisoprolol, 7.5 milligrams uh, once daily. Um, she was on a little bit of diuretic and also was anticoagulated. I believe the anticoagulation was started by a um, consultant who reviewed her um, in clinic. Um, in terms of social history, so she's a pathology lab technician, quite an active job, um, on her feet quite a lot. She's a non-smoker. Um, not particularly a drinker and was quite independent uh, in terms of her activities of daily living. Um, so the, the story as, as we gathered from when we reviewed her, so she'd had uh, a history of failure to thrive as a baby, had been reasonably well after her surgery in the 70s, had gone through two normal pregnancies without any particular issues, though she, she was quite a stoic um, typical sort of Yorkshire woman. So um, she did complain of a little bit of breathlessness on occasion, but didn't really limit her capacity to, to do anything. Um, up until October 2019, when things started to deteriorate, so worsening dyspnea, struggling to sort of mobilise around the house, really struggling with work, but still sort of going in and trying her best. Um, she also described palpitations and more worryingly um, episodes of sort of pre-syncope. Um, so I thought I'd open this out to the floor and um, sort of what's everyone's sort of current differential. I mean, the talk topic is a big giveaway. Um, what kind of things would you be looking out for on examination, especially given sort of things that Dr. Oliver's mentioned? Uh, if anyone could read stuff out in the chat, that would be great. I'd like to see the chest x -ray. Yes. Anything else? What, what would you... The ECG. Yeah, ECG, yeah. Um, what, what would you be looking out when examining this patient? So any sort of clinical signs that would... I'd like me to look at that. So I guess looking for any murmurs or um, sorry, that's uh, a bit of feedback. Um, I guess looking for kind of sternal heave as well. Yeah. I think someone else in the chat mentioned needs an echo. Yes, absolutely needs an echo, and we'll go through that. So 
I'll, I'll run through the sort of um, clinical examination. So when we saw the patient in clinic, blood pressure was satisfactory, heart rate was about 89 beats per minute, uh, saturations were 97% on room air, huge sort of V waves in the JVP, um, sort of soft systolic murmur, and then pulsatile hepatomegaly as well, um, which is sort of in keeping really with the sort of picture. Um, so obviously, this lady, I mean, we're probably, as you can guess, we're sort of going towards a diagnosis of Epstein's. What, what, so people have sort of mentioned some investigations, so we're going to get an echo, an ECG, a chest x-ray. Um, what, what are you thinking in terms of management? So you've got a 54-year-old, very short, you know, very dyspneic lady who's usually very active. Um, what sort of management options do you think she's looking at? I guess, would you be thinking about surgery in this case, or? So often if you see somebody like this who's acutely changed, so she was doing OK and then not doing OK, all of a sudden there's, us there's, there's usually a cause for it. Um, and that cause in Epstein's is often the onset of atrial arrhythmia, um, as it is in many other things. Uh, so um, if you if you deem that they've got the onset of atrial arrhythmia associated with their decline in symptoms, then the first thing to try to treat is atrial arrhythmia um, and then reassess the situation. But at this stage of the game, she's potentially looking, as Emilosh says, at surgical intervention to try to improve things. So it may, be, may well be a bit late. Yeah. Um, so ECG uh, we've got here. Um, can anybody sort of comment? I'm determined to make people <laughs> do the work for me. So what do we think of this ECG? have to nominate someone, Steffi. Milash, I'm picking on you. <laughs> um, well, it looks regular. I'm trying to see if I can really make out any P waves, but it's a bit difficult from this. I it guess is. there is, yeah, there's some P waves, but maybe it's just... I thought it looked like, especially looking at the rhythm strip, yeah. too, it looks like there's lots of flutter waves. Um, but then I think I think in V three you can see like a P wave followed by a QRS. Well, it leads one. It looks like that very first one just before the QRS. I thought was a P. Yeah, it's, it's but then, Yeah. Yeah. So look yeah. at the rhythm strip. Yeah, the rhythm. Yeah. Strip Change it. It's atrial flutter. And it's variable block. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean that's again in keeping with the history of Epstein's as Kate. Is mentioned and then look look at the ECG computer interpretation which is completely wrong yeah yeah <laughs> number one lesson yeah never believe it um, so yeah she's she's in flutter she's appropriately anticoagulated her rate's actually not too bad but she has been describing sort of episodes of palpitations but I suppose her most was the dissipated and shortness of breath um, and that's sort of important to note so we'll go on to echo. Um, so this was her sort of four chamber view, and you can see the massively dilated uh, right ventricle there. Um, and you can see the sort of line that you can see where the annulus, tricuspid valve annulus should be. Um, and then you can see the actual valve itself. You can see the septal leaflets quite a bit sort of displaced, quite a bit lower down. And then, um, and, and quite abnormal, morphologically abnormal. Um, she's got huge, huge right atrium and a tiny squished little left side of her heart as well. Um, and then this is to sort of demonstrate the severity of the tricuspid regurg, um, which is pretty severe. Um, some sort of a bit more quantification, so of, of her actual TR there as well that you can appreciate. Um, and then her, her mitral valve isn't completely normal either. I think it's, it's quite regurgitant 
as well and that's something that which made her case quite sort of tricky to manage and made us all quite worried about her um and then i thought i'd just mention this um another case that we had in this week of web signs that i had um who was a similar sort of presentation so a lady in her 60s uh presenting with worsening shortness of breath she had actually had a tricuspid valve tissue sort of replacement many many years ago maybe maybe about 10 years or so ago um and her tricuspid valve replacement wasn't doing so well and she's quite severely regurgitant um, but she also had coexisting severe MR so she's another one that we're quite concerned about sort of, in terms of future management um, so yeah so we've got the so going back to our lady so we've got the echo report there so you can as we've sort of already commented the right ventricle severely dilated as is the right atrium got a very sort of uh, short and tethered septal leaflet uh, with severe tricuspid regurgitation. The IVC is also dilated. Um, so, I mean, I kind of gave the game away there. So the next step here really is information gathering with this lady, especially given that she sort of has presented to us after sort of many years of being, you know, not under medical follow-up. Um, and so the next step really is an MRI. Um, which again demonstrated sort of similar, so sort of correlated with the findings on the echo. Um, we were able to sort of um, quant quantify that there was no sort of hemodynamically dynamically significant shunt, which again is something important to look out for. As Dr. Oliver's mentioned, these guys can have sort of instant or ASDs. Um, so, yeah. We've got all this information now. So what, what do people think we're heading for with this lady um, in terms of next stages in management? Can I just quickly mention, Stephanie, that um, just a note for particularly echo people out there that um, preserved RV systolic function in the setting of that torrential TR does not mean that RV is very healthy. Um, um, so just have to be very careful about that. Um, you know, tricuspid valve competence, as this case will illustrate when you finish off, um, uh, doesn't the, the RV will be quite significantly impaired. You mean sort of wording wise, so it can be false or reassuring. Well, you can see good motion of the walls of the RV, can't you? But that's because it's all going backwards. And right. as, soon as, yeah. as soon as you make that valve competent, then you'll see what the RV function is really like. Hi, Steffi. Um, can I take a, another quick comment, please? Yes, yes, absolutely. So it's quite difficult when you're describing um, right heart in Epstein's patients. Um, when you're commenting on size and function of the right ventricle, it's quite difficult um, to explain what you actually mean. Do you mean that the right ventricle is dilated or do you mean that the portion of the ventricle that's below the tricuspid valve is dilated and actually more often than not um, you mean that it's part of the atrialized portion but the the nomenclature is really quite difficult I try and do it by just saying exactly what I can see so it's clear to the person but but often if you take what is actually the below the valve right ventricle it's often actually quite quite small and looks like it's functioning fine but that's kind of the nature of the nature of it it's just a comment that people can find quite difficult that's a really good point helen um, just because the pathology is so abnormal um calling it a right ventricle isn't really uh, not quite right is it yeah um thank you uh, so, moving on with this lady, other sort of information that we gathered. So, she had a cardiac catheter as well, um, which we've got sort of values for here. Um, the conclusion from that was that, um, you know, as, as we'd kind of gathered from her clinical presentation, that she had quite severe Epstein's with poor cardiac output. However, her PA pressures were normal, which was a really important uh, finding as. Dr. Oliver sort of previously mentioned that these people with sort of normal PA pressures are suitable for sort of Glen uh, shunts. Um, so it just is an important piece of information to gather for this lady. Um, I don't know, Dr. Oliver, if you want to sort of 
uh, comment on any other aspects of her cardiac catheter or? Um, she's, um, uh, let me have a quick look at uh, these data. Her, um, where's her PA? Where are we? It's a bit so, uh, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me have a quick look. So we've got a mean PA pressure of 17, so that's that's OK. We need effectively the main reason. There's a number of reasons for doing a catheter in her, but one of the particularly important bits of information we want to know is what our mean PA pressure is, so that if we connect the Glen shunt, there'll be flow flow through it. So um, that's OK. That's normal for a PA pressure. Um, interestingly, her LV is relative, is it OK to normal? That's, in her case, that her uh, sort of left heart has proved to be a bit of an issue post-op. Um, in terms of stats, there's no particular evidence of a shunt there, I don't think, looking at those, um, uh, those numbers. Um, so we could see, so we've done, so we've done a SATS one there. Um, that would help us to quantify any degree, mainly well, any degree of shunting. Um, but of course, that could be bi-directional shunting in, in the case of Epstein. So it doesn't mean there isn't an extra communication. I don't think there was not there, but um, uh, so it all has to be in context, I suppose. Yeah, she didn't have an atrial, intra-atrial communication. Um, and of course, whilst you're gathering all this, sort of, um, all this sort of data and numbers, it's also important, especially because this lady was heading towards the JCC discussion, um, to get an idea of her functional capacity. So we did do a, a CPEX on her. Um, she didn't manage very long. She managed about four minutes. Um, and I think she ended up having a bit of a vagal do, um, didn't quite collapse, but couldn't really sort of continue the test and we had to terminate it. Um, she was in flutter throughout the um, exercise test with sort of a good BP response. VO2 max was about 14.6. Um, and she did she did desaturate a little bit um, at peak exercise, but we weren't sure whether that was just with everything that happened at the crux of her exercise with her having her funny do. Um, so yeah, her functional capacity is demonstrably quite poor. Um, so I think this lady, we then ended up submitting to the Joint Surgical Conference um, and our question was, is there anything from a surgical perspective to try and optimise, you know, her symptom? Um, so her imaging, uh, you know, as, as discussed, has been, was reviewed. Um, in particular, we noted that she had mild to moderate MR as well um, and sort of had a look at her pulmonary annulus as well, which measured at about 21 millimetres on MRI. Um, as Dr. Oliver's mentioned, there was no obvious shunt. So, firstly, we were concerned about surgery given the long standing severity of her symptoms. So, her symptoms have been going on since 2019. However, she's 54 and has probably had these changes in her heart for a long time. Um, and there was a question about whether we do a percutaneous pulmonary valve to reduce the operation time because we knew that the pulmonary valve needed intervention but whether doing a percutaneous valve would then mean that you don't have as much time sort of you're just focusing on the other two valves um so the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve um but because her main pulmonary artery was quite short it was decided that the access would be too difficult and it was better to just tackle everything from a surgical perspective so the outcome of the jcc discussion was for this lady to go ahead for a tricuspid valve repair or replacement um, if a repair wasn't feasible. Um, she would also need a pulmonary valve replacement and a mitral valve inspection, which we, I think the outcome was that she'd probably need an annuloplasty ring um, and then sort of a maze procedure and an epicardial pacemaker as well. So, and, and consideration for a, a Glenn shunt. Um, so huge, huge sort of operation. Uh, which we were all quite nervous about, really, um, but it needed to be done given how significant her symptoms were. Um, so she did actually undergo the operation on the 18th of May. So she had, as we've discussed, both tricuspid and pulmonary valve replaced with a biprosthetic. She had a mitral valve annuloplasty. Um, 
the left atrial appendage was excised. This is obviously because of her risk of atrial arrhythmias and thrombotic risk. And she did go ahead and have a, a glen shunt as well. So it wasn't a straightforward operation. She had a very rocky post-operative course. So the first day, as the same evening that she was um, stepped down from theatres to ICU, her lactate sort of skyrocketed, um, blood pressure became unstable. Um, and despite sort of inotropic support, um, she ended up having to be taken back to theatre. They actually didn't find any sort of bleeding points when they went back in. Um, However, on measuring sort of chambers, it was felt that this was all sort of a low output state um, due to sort of diastolic dysfunction. Um, and she was sort of taken back to ICU and, and sort of left with a, an open sternum just to allow her some time. Um, and actually, probably about four or five days later, she did have, go back to have her sternum closed and then made quite a good smooth recovery after that but I think that, that those first few days as as we kind of anticipated with this lady it was a bit touch and go um, but yeah so she was discharged from hospital 16 days post-operation and uh, we reviewed her again sort of a week after discharge and she's making really good progress um, so that's the case really um, I don't know if anyone's got any other questions or want to review any of the images or investigations that we've discussed so, Steffi, do you think do you think that we did it in the right way, or do you think there would have been mileage in trying to sort her rhythm out to get her out of atrial flutter and then see what she was like? I think we did the right thing because I don't think um, I think her problem was the fact that her tricuspid valve was obviously very regurgitant, but as was her, she had issues with her mitral valve as well. So I'm not sure just sorting out her rhythm would have really sorted out her symptoms. Do you think if we'd sorted out her rhythm, say, by cardio, do you think we would have had a long-term long success with that or not? Or Absolutely. even ablating her? Uh, I don't think so. No, um, well, especially yeah. with some massive her atrial, uh, uh, I think she would have just been straight, gone straight back into flutter. Yeah. So I that's... Think did, I think we cardioversed her. We did, yeah. And did all her investigations in one day. Yeah. Pretty <laughs> impressive. And then um, Cardi voted her the same day, but I think she went straight back into it. Yeah, she did. And um, so it's it just that thing about if you've got a structural abnormality that's driving an, an, a rhythm abnormality, unless you can deal with the underlying structural abnormality or mileage in trying to get rid of the arrhythmia is um, limited. Can I just ask, do you think there are lots of patients like this in general cardiology practices? Probably. Maybe not as bad as this, um, but I think there are, because it's one of those things that presents in adult life often for the first time, they don't necessarily always kind of get through to us. And I think there's also historic cases that have been seen in specialist services that have then not been treated because kind of in the olden days we didn't treat them and then have been lost to follow up or discharged back to local cardiology follow up um so yeah i think there probably are quite a few i don't know with her um i did wonder because we saw her after a long gap um whether with regular follow-up things would have changed, you know, the way we managed her, would we have done things in bits rather than having to do this mega operation with everything on one go? I don't know. Um, I think we would have done it earlier. Yeah. Um, and I think the concern was that the right ventricles already, by the time you get to that stage, the right ventricles already really dysfunctional. Um, and that's the major concern um, as to how they do post-operatively, is how, how the right ventricle behaves. Um, so she's very happy with the outcome. I'm just going to cover up the NHS number on the top. But she sent us a thank you letter, oh. which is really nice. That was when she came for her 25-day uh, post-op 
uh, clinic visit she brought a very large bag of sweets and biscuits <laughs> so she was doing quite well she was pretty stoic actually you know she was pretty, yeah she was she recovered as quickly as she did yeah any other questions how did her right ventricle look pre discharge because i couldn't see any visible contraction and <laughs> You remember? I didn't see it. I think it didn't. It actually didn't look too bad. Okay. Uh, I'm just checking to see if there's an echo report. I can certainly think of a few Epstein's, one or two Epstein's that we've done where the RV look continues to look absolutely dreadful, but the patient still describes, you know, yeah. a symptomatic improvement. Uh, um, so having got them through surgery, it was still the right thing to do. Having the blocking the echo seems to seems yeah. to. And I think that there's a long lag in the improvement in the RV. I think you still see improvement in the RV from even one to two years post surgery. Yeah. I think it just takes its it takes its you know merry time to sort itself out really. And as it is such a tricky operation, is it like very much down to a surgeon getting more experience to do these? You know, because I know previously we would refer to like Bristol, didn't we, um, at one point, because the surgeon had more experience. I think we've tried in house to concentrate the, the surgical expertise in one surgical surgeon's hands rather than spread it around. So we think there is a technical aspect to it that it. It's quite a challenging operation to do, um, so we do try and concentrate that expertise. Did you find a, an echo report, Steffi? Yeah. Just, it's, I'm just wary of talking about the RV without looking at the images, just after Helen spoke as well, but the RV is still severely impaired. Uh, yeah. Seven millimeters of the S prime four centimeters per second. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see how she is in a year. Yeah. yeah. Probably worth repeating her exercise test in a year's time and see if she's got functional benefit. That's a good point, yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll have to wrap it up, I think, won't we? So thanks to James and Steffi uh, for presenting and everybody else for attending. Um, We'll obviously make it this available um, online as well for people that couldn't attend uh, for the live uh, presentations. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks. See you, Howard. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.